Hi there. From where I sit in my 53 going on 54 perch, it's pretty easy to say that I think overall we've made a lot of progress in accepting different body types. We've become more body positive. We've sort of shifted our beauty standards. I mean, models no longer need to be the width of a pinky, which helps the rest of us non-pinky width people feel more confident too. I mean, you know, a lot of them are still the width of a pinky, but whatever. And still, it's estimated that over 70% of women in the U.S. dye their hair. <laughs> Myself, for sure, included in that. And of course, not everyone who dyes their hair does so to cover up the gray that sprouts in as we dare to age. But a lot do, because it can be scary to outwardly admit that you're getting older. For example... I like to tell people that my natural hair color right now is the color of rat fur. Not, not like a sexy rat that you might buy in a pet store, but like a subway rat that you would scream and, and run away from. <laughs> Our society loves to ignore women, and it basically disappears gray-haired women, which is very uncool because, you know, I probably could pull off silver hair if it was really nice silver hair, but then I'm fairly certain I would legally no longer be permitted on television. My grandmother dyed her hair through her very final days because she was convinced and probably correct at the time that if she didn't maintain her perfectly coiffed blonde hair, they wouldn't serve her at the fish counter anymore. That is how invisible she would be. I must have completely internalized some of that because... Look, at 53, do you think that my hair is still honey blonde? This color is made by science. Thanks to the pandemic, which definitely feels weird to say, a lot of women were forced to stop coloring their hair. And then even when they were able to, again, decided to embrace their natural hair color and stop treating it at all, altogether. All of a sudden, more and more women became confident in their authentic appearances. And I love that for them. Maybe one day I'll join them. I just don't quite feel like risking not getting served at the fish counter yet. Like, I love fish. We can talk about it later. This is Choice Words. I'm Samantha B. My guest today is Ricky Lake. And I seriously loved seeing her gray hair looking back at me while recording this episode. I know you can't see it, but picture it with your ears as you listen. So take a listen and make good choices. Oh my God. God, I can't believe we're, <laughs> I can't believe I'm finally meeting you. I feel like I've, you've always been a part of my life. It's awesome. It's really awesome. <gasps> okay. Well, you know that the promise of this podcast is that we're going to talk about like big choices that you've made. And that is like a big launch pad for our other conversations. I have so much I want to ask you about because again, because I feel like I've been an observer of your life from a distance for so, so goddamn long. <laughs> My 35 years. Hairspray oh, this year is 35 years old. So yeah, a long oh, time. If you think <laughs> back, if you think back to your long storied career, can you name a choice that you made that really particularly stands out as something that totally changed your life? It was like the catalyst for something. I mean, there are so many. There's so many phases in my life that if I, it's like sliding doors. If I'd right. gone this way or this way, yeah. like my whole life would be different. So you could go back to like when I went to the audition for Hairspray and sure. met John Waters and that opened that whole world to me. But I think of late, the the most sort of transformational choice that I made that I have chill, I have literally goosebumps oh. talking about it was when I made the decision to shave my head and come out with my secret of hair loss that I was suffering with for many, 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 many years, decades. And wow. so it was the scariest thing I've ever, and I've had my baby in my bathtub with no drugs. Yep. I have like done a lot of kind of brave people would consider brave or ballsy. This, this choice that I made and we're coming up on four years was the, yeah, the scariest one. And I felt like I had been back into a corner. I didn't feel like I had any other option. I, a lot of it, I'm, I'm someone who, um, 
I share, like I'm an overshare. I talk, right. you know, people who grew up with me with my show, they know that like I am so transparent with basically everything. And with this part of my life, this piece of me where I consider myself to be so authentic and just an open book, this is this piece that I was not being authentic and I was, I was suffering. And so, yeah, it came to a head December 31st, 2019, right before the new decade, right, right before 2020. So I made that decision and I told very few people and, and yeah, it was, it was a physical transformation that I did, but it was more mostly internal. Like it was coming to a place of real, true self-acceptance. Like this is who I am. Uh, this is what I've been going through, you know, and, and I didn't know how like the public would react. I, I didn't have an agenda other than I wanted to be set free from this thing right. that was tormenting me. Well, okay. Uh, there are, I have so many follow-up questions. Like for one thing, I just want to say that people's identities, especially women, I think uh, we're really, our identities can be tied into our hair, our sense of self, yeah. our pride, our femininity, our, I mean, you know, and I can only talk about myself and what I went through, but I've, I've like, I follow all these amazing women on social media that are real, like, cheerleaders and and they're also very outspoken about their journey with their hair loss and it's super common it's like the kind of hair loss that i have is called androgenetic alopecia and it's like it affects 50 percent of women or something like 50 percent right. of women are going to experience significant hair loss in their in their lifetime and it is traumatic and and anyone that has suffered with that i don't know if, if you, after your babies you stop breastfeeding and oh, your yeah. hair just dumps in the shower and your dumps. whole i mean Clumps. i would hold piles of hair and i don't have that much hair and it was just it was just super scary and and I know people that ha don't suffer from this, they can't really understand. They're like, get over it, it's just hair. But for me, I was on television all the time. I was having right. to get to look a certain way. And you know, I resorted to wearing like hair pieces and extensions for, for years, and which took its toll on my hair. Anyway, that is the choice I think that was really pivotal in, in changing the real trajectory of my life at that at, at, for my 50s. You know, it's I, I ended up meeting Ross and my husband, who I may not have really recognized and saw as a good person for me right. if I hadn't gone through that that real shift. Boy, I love stories where people are just throwing off because like, uh, and that is tied to shame too. Like you probably, it seems like you were living in a state yes. of shame. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. And, you know, and because like, I, I didn't, I didn't even tell my therapist, like, like I, I'm someone that, yeah, because I was embarrassed <gasps> and I felt like, and I, and, and you start to go crazy. Like you start right. to like, I could feel hair falling oh. on my shoulder. Like I was acutely aware of right. the shedding and I would do, I did everything. I was taking Propecia, which is like a drug that's for men. It's not even FDA approved for women. I was taking that. I was, I was doing anything and everything, but all of it was like private you know it was like my friends a lot of them like did not know I suffered from this you know wow so, yeah okay so that's a huge choice to throw off the yoke of shame like to throw off that albatross that was hanging around your neck and to reveal your true authentic self that's incredible I love this story so much it was it was big and you know when I did make the choice I I it was calculated in that I wanted it documented like I'm yeah. someone that like I you know I make a documentary I, I film my home birth I wanted I didn't know it was going to be in a documentary but I I wanted to have like something to look back on this this moment this right. real like turning point so I had my dear friend who's an amazing photographer shoot it I had my dearest friends with me you know I have it all like like preserved and um it was, it was incredible. It was honestly like once I did it, like I had the, you know, the buzzer to my yeah. scalp and it was like this release, like this, like, like just total liberation from this, that this albatross that was on right. me. I, I'm saying it sounds so hyperbolic, but I, it, it really, really was deep, like deep, it's deep work. Deep. I got to tell you that when my grandma, and we was so close with my grandmother, like we were, you know, she did, she really raised me in a, in, in a lot of ways. And when she was on her literal deathbed, like dying of cancer, she had me dye her roots. Like, cause she didn't want to be in the hospital with like roots. Do you understand what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. So when you yeah. talk about hair, were you? Were you an adult? I was an adult. Yeah, I was in my late okay. 20s, in my late 20s. And I often die. I mean, it was our ritual. You know, it was like a box of Clairol. Like, yeah. she had like, <laughs> she naturally had dark, straight hair, but she wore it blonde and curly, you know, because <laughs> she felt that she should have I been born in, yeah. looking like Shirley Temple. That's 
Anyway, the point is <laughs> when you're less grandma, bless her. And uh, because so much of her, she couldn't even she couldn't even die in the presence of roots. It was so shameful. So I really am connected to talking and thinking about hair. It's I know. And I, I stopped coloring my hair after I shaved my mm -hmm. head, which was it was so fortuitous because I did this right before 2020, the yeah. night before 2020. Oh, and then the, the, the pandemic happened. Yes. So I would have had to shave my head regardless three months later because I could, you know, my girl couldn't come to me. So right. I would have been shaving my head under duress, under like a totally right. different thing. <gasps> so it ended up being such a huge blessing, a huge lesson. I am like, I, I just love myself even more right. having persevered through that. Mm -hmm. And and now I'm on the other side and it's like a non-issue. I don't stress about it anymore. Right. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's wild. And I never expected my hair to grow back. <laughs> I know, but it looks, it, it looks great. If I, I can I say it. I kind of did like... a quick blow dry for yeah. you this morning, but, but thank you. I have hair. So I'm just like, I don't complain about it. I'm okay. My body feels good. I'm almost 55. I, I can't complain. You know, it's like, it's all good. It's all good. And how did people react? I betcha because it's so connected to all of those things that we've been talking about and it's, it creates passionate feelings in people. Other people's hair <laughs> causes passionate reactions in people. So how, how do people... I mean, it's so funny because we're talking about this and we're acting like it's like it's an earthquake and it's a personal earthquake, but it... Right. Right. No, I know. I know. I, I get that people are like, why do, they, why do they think this is a big deal? You know, I don't know. I, I just, I, I do feel like my fans or people that, that, that grew up with me, they have accepted me at every stage of how I look, you know, right. whether I'm 260 pounds or I'm 120 pounds, which I have been both without surgery, you know, and, and my gray hair, I mean, it became cool. COVID right. made it cool to not cover, color your hair. So I don't know. I, I, I I, I'm I'm just appreciative. Like I am one of those people that I jump head first and I yeah. always land on my feet. Like anything I've done, like I really have done kind of crazy stuff, very impulsive, and yet it's always kind of worked out for me in the end. Have you always been an impulsive decision maker in that sense? Like do you is that how you make all your big life choices? You're like, I'm fucking doing it. Yeah. And I don't think it through, which I think has been a gift. <laughs> Very good. Like I don't, I don't ever like see the forest for the trees. I'm right. always in the moment. Like that feels good. Like my talk show, for instance, I yeah. mean, I, I was, that, I was not working at that time. I was 20, I was 23 years old when I got a phone call to go on this meeting for this talk show. Okay. I went, I didn't even think it through that it was actually going to make it on the air, let alone right move me to New York, help me meet my first house, you know, like all of it that happened. And it was just like, all right, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it for $5,000. Like I needed <laughs> in the moment I needed my rent paid for six months. I was like, sure, I'll do it. So like every day, making a, making a documentary about birth or all of my documentaries, right. we don't really, I just felt called to do it. I had to do it. Right. Um, post nine 11. I don't know if you're familiar with my story, but I, I was, I was downtown in my apartment witnessing nine 11 mm. firsthand mm -hmm. two months after having my home birth in that same space. What? And so I was particular, I mean, we were all traumatized that day, but my hormones and my, like, I just, and, and I got, had to get out. I had to get out of New York. I right. had to get out of New York. I had to get out of a lot of things, moved to LA and started this calling. I call it to, to, to explore birth, birth options in the United States. I was really, um, just really like confused as to why my really amazing friends that I look up to didn't seem to care about the process of, of giving birth. They just right. wanted the help. So it was just, yeah, I went on that journey and that 9-11 happened. And in that moment made that decision, I'm getting out of here. And it just, again, changed, shifted my career, shifted my focus. And I found my true passion through, through that trauma. Once you made that choice and you were like, I got to get out of here, I got to do something different. How long did it take before you were actually able to execute on that? vision for yourself. It took, it took a year and a half, a year and a half because so, cause we, I had to finish my show. I had a contract yes, with my right. show and I was married and I was married in New York. So I wanted to move to California. I mean, it was a lot of juggling, a lot of stuff I had to do meeting with attorneys. I mean, I had to like, yeah, it was like putting my big girl pants on and, <laughs> but I, I was one of those people, like I love New York. I'm from New York. I'm born and raised, but right. I didn't feel safe anymore. I did not, right. I don't feel safe anymore. When I, when we, you know, the National Guard came into our neighborhood yeah. and I had to go back to work and I'm nursing a two month old. And I, I mean, Ooh. it was, it was intense and, 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 
But in in a way, it was like it happened in that I found what I was meant to do because I really do look at the documentary film work, the particularly the birth movie. Mm-hmm. That is that's my reason for 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 that's why I had that talk show. That's why I'm a public figure because right. I believe I'm putting out material that's super important um, and making a difference in people's lives. Right. Right. Oh my god. Oh. What a, I just can't imagine you starting restarting your show. Nine eleven has happened, and you're nursing a two month old. Oh, we that I is... had to go to work a day later, Sam. I had to go back to work, and uh-huh. we did a show. I can't, and it was like my baby daddy thinks I'm a hoochie, <laughs> you know. And and there was a bomb scare in our building. Ah. Like like it was chaos. It was chaos. And it's like it was in that moment. I'm like, okay, I want like. I want, I mean, as, as as shallow as it may sound, I want my legacy to be something more than this. Right. You know, the talk show was great. It was a phenomenon. It was so successful. I'm super proud of it. We did great work. Like, the stuff we did for for gay relationships, yeah. for, for everybody being represented and being treated with respect is something I'm super proud of. Right. But I feel like I had that platform in order to be able to make these smaller films that are about something pretty provocative and being able to, like, feed that to the mainstream that, that no, that I'm not full of shit, that I'm not, I don't have an agenda, and I just am curious about these things and right. and want to help people. And you're willing to document yourself d- doing these yes. things because you're just so yeah. open. As crazy as that sounds. I mean, I, someone asked me just recently if I wanted to go on a show and do ayahuasca on camera. Uh, and I and was what like, was your take okay. on that? Mm. I was like, that's where I draw the line. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with that plant medicine, but that's yes. not to do it like for attention or, or publicity. That right. is not the reason to do it. And it will kick your ass even more than it normally would. Right. I would very <laughs> much be afraid of what would come out of any orifice in my body. I don't know. I don't know. It has. I mean, I've done it many times. Like, uh-huh. I'm very familiar with that medicine. And yes, mm-hmm. it does come out of every orifice. <laughs> but um, yeah, the idea of doing it on a television show, like yeah. on a reality show, not for me. <laughs> Want to listen to the rest of this episode? Head over to your favorite podcast player to hear the entire show. I highly recommend it.